we're coming down today. This is kind of a new class for us. We've never really done a wildlife specific class and I'm not here as a, a hunter, gamer, killer of any means. So I'll say that right off the bat. So this is about maybe repelling them and sending them to your neighbors a little bit easier. <laughs> um, or keeping them from eating certain things. I'm hoping we're gonna kind of do that. Now I did this class for the Master Gardener Winter Speaker Series. It was like three times as long as we have today. So we're gonna go pretty fast. Um, it was specifically on rabbits then. If you look at the handout available on our website, it says rabbits in the garden, but you'll see all kinds of references in there to all wildlife. The same exact repellents are gonna get used if we have a rabbit, a deer, a vole, uh, sometimes a mole, a arm who's got an armadillo around here? Cause that's, that's a yeah. variable too. Uh, but there's quite a few creatures. The same methodology is gonna work. I'll, I'll mention fencing and some different things that will change for deer in particular, but uh, we're going to probably, I think most people are interested in Mr. Rabbit and Mr. Deer first of all. So we're going to kind of focus on those two today. So uh, hopefully we'll have a little fun. Uh, this is a class we got lots of chuckles out of at the uh, Ever Station a couple months ago when I did it. But uh, you, you got to laugh sometimes because it, sometimes it is what it is. They come and visit us and take our stuff. So we always start uh, with, with the two favorite rabbits, right? So we got Bugs Bunny, everyone knows that one, and then Tricks. My mom never let me have any sugar cereal, so I had to put that, uh, that Tricks box on there. But, uh, you know, in all seriousness, rabbits, you know, many cultures consider the rabbit to bring fertility, love, creativity, symbolizes compassion, intuition, to find them in your garden is thought of a blessing in many places around the world. So who thinks they're a blessing? I don't. So, there you go. So we'll start with that, a little chuckle. So these are the other two guys. I, I used to have a cool shirt. It had a squirrel on it with like the black and white uh, background like he's getting booked for jail. You know, wanted in nine local neighborhoods for grand larceny, theft, property destruction, you know, all the rest. So uh, we all chuckle. Although the, that's one I fight in my yard. I love the squirrels and watch them hop around, but uh, certainly we'll mention squirrels a little bit today too. Uh, the deer I do not have. Um, our family had a place in Cleelum for years, so I'll tell you what's worse than a deer is an elk. And I had elk that uh, mowed our family's orchard and everything for over 30 years over there. So um, I have dealt with deer elk for many times as well, and I'll, I'll hopefully give you a couple tricks on those. So I would off, start off with this, because I think all of us love to be outside. We love our, our planet Earth. We care about living creatures. So this is a tough discussion, because again, I'm not going to get into hunting and trapping and killing and maiming and all the rest of it today. We're going to try to do something peaceful and have them move on to the neighbors, hopefully. So, um, you know, we all like to have them visit our yard. I know everybody talks about, oh, there was a cute little bunny in my grass this morning and this and that. and then. Five minutes later, you're like, how do I get rid of them? You know, you don't want them around there. So, so just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, a couple dis disclaimers for me. You know, again, we're, we're talking, I'll use rabbit, I'll use deer, I'll use all these things. All the same repellents and a lot of the same methodologies are going to really apply to all of them. We're obviously going to be a lot lower for the rabbit. We're going to be a lot taller for the deer. But we're going to use a lot of the same practices and same ideas as we try to combat them. You know, I spent a lot of years, 20 years ago, trying to make a backyard wildlife habitat in my own yard. I love to have birds, squirrels, all the above. Now, when they cross the line, then we, then we, we got we to gotta do some things to stop them. But um, I think we have one here. Steve's backyard is that way. Um, it's an important thing, I think, to find that balance between nature. But I always try to throw that in there. So, we're, again, we're not trying to get rid of them off the face of the earth. Um, you know, with wildlife... This could be anything. I even brought mole repellent in here if we're going to call that wildlife. But, you know, with wildlife, I'm always going to try to find their food source first. What are they there to eat? Now, some things will eat just about everything. Other things will pick and choose a little more. But I think we'd all admit, you know, a hungry creature like we would be, we'd eat just about anything if we're trying to survive when it comes down to it. So um, there's going to be a, a, a lot of things for me. I look to food supply first. You know, that's, that's the thing. Um, you know, then I'm going to look to try to repel them somehow with something safe to get them out of the yard. Uh, we only carry natural repellents here, so none of this is any kind of poison for anything at all. Um, and then maybe the final straw is all right here, which I did last year. You're into certain places, I can't have you anymore. We're going to do some, something that's kind of halt, halt the progression. So, okay. um, all we have wildlife we just talked about this today they learn, they adapt. They're going to change. I mean, what works for me is not going to work for you. What works for her is not going to work for him. I'm going to go right down the line. We're going to have to try this a few, a few different ways probably to have success. 
Um, always read the label. You know, that's a huge thing, uh, especially when we get towards edible parts of this discussion. Read the label, use it as it's directed. None of this stuff has any poisoning in it, so we're just looking to have them go, ooh, I don't like that smell or that taste, I'm gonna go somewhere else instead. So if we do use them properly and follow the directions, um, you're gonna have good luck with the, with the products on here. Um, you know, I go organic in my own garden. We had organic uh, gardening class yesterday. Um, I don't choose the murder, death, kill approach, which anything, period, um, sometimes bugs once in a while, but usually try to deter those as well. Um, but again, this is your yard, you know, your choice, your price specimen you're trying to protect. So you're going to need to make your own choice. Those are, those are mine, not yours. Um, you know, I love cute little furry creatures, and I have two young sons, so I'm certainly not going to have them come out in the yard to see me with a pellet gun trying to get Mr. Rabbit off my lawn. So um, that's just the honest truth. I don't mind having them around, but we're going to try to keep them again in certain areas. Um, you know, I try to share some of the garden. I mean, there's some things they're going to like. There's other things they won't. So, you know, I'm going to try this year, honestly. I'm going to plant a little stuff over in the corner and see if I can just have the rabbits that come in every day go over there and eat and maybe stay away from my vegetable garden a little bit more. So we'll see. Uh, there's a lot of great information online. So this is one of the classes I will bring up the Internet. I think if you go to Washington State, Oregon State, two great Northwest Ag schools, there's master gardener information, extent, all of the above locally here where you can get great information on just western Washington, what's a good resistant way to do for deer, for rabbits, for mountain beaver, we can go down the Rhine, you can find some really good, really good tips online as well. So for me, my first one was Mr. Raccoon, and I don't care for the trash panda, that is one I, I might purchase a hell again someday for, but not really. Um, he destroyed my yard like the last three, four years, so that's one I have a personal relationship, he hasn't been back for a while. Um, actually four of them, so I'm sure it was he, her, and a couple of the young ones. Um, they destroyed my yard a couple, for a couple years in a row, and I was able to try some of the stuff I'm talking about today, and I have not seen them. I'm going to reach back and knock on wood, because I'm sure he'll be back at some point. But I noticed for me, um, the one thing that was missing in my backyard was water. So I added a little water feature, I love the sound of water. I sit on my patio and forget home from work, and it's just a ah, soothing sound of water coming out of my little water feature. Um, that's when Mr. Raccoon showed up, so I think that might be the reason. I'm not going to get rid of it, but I thought, you know, it's probably half my fault, so we'll call it even, and I'll just try to get you to move on. Um, I kind of wrote on there, you'll see some pictures here, some stuff I'm trying at home for me. Um, you know, I'm good with free lawn food, and I want to I kind of say that half-jokingly, but the first thing I noticed with rabbits in particular were little presents they left all over my grass, and I'm kind of an OCD lawn guy, so I walk my grass all the time and say, ooh, what's that, and what's this, and here's one leaf on here I'll get rid of. Um, and I found piles and piles and piles and more piles. And I thought, God, what am I going to do with all this? I don't want my kids stepping on, and the wife's going to be mad at me because they tracked some rabbit poop in the house, you know, the rest. After I spent, like, way too long scooping it up, and putting it in my bucket for the yard waste, I thought, I'm gonna look on and see if this is really useful. Rabbit manure is a great additive, so I, I leave it. So it's free fertilizer for me, which is what that means. That's a cold manure, so there's never any chance of anything burning. So I leave it all over the lawn. It's like, what the heck? It's just gonna biodegrade. It turns into great organic fertilizer for me. Um, you'll see in a while, I'm gonna actually make some rabbit compost tea this summer and see how it helps my plants as well. It kind of sounds gross, but we'll see. <laughs> Um, you know, part of the problem isn't always sometimes you, it's your neighbor, you know, and sometimes you'll keep these things down and nesting sites and wood piles and all this stuff down and I look across the fence and I'm like, well, yeah, they're coming from right of there because they don't do that. Um, so sometimes it might be a gentle discussion with the neighbor like, hey, you know, whether it's the rat, the hole, the mice, whatever's coming out of there uh, might be helpful with the neighbors as well. Um, I always treat my backyard as experimenting ground, so I play around with all kinds of stuff, and again, I'll show you in the pictures here, um, you know, some things I'm trying out here again this year. Um, to me, it's Repelzol. I use a lot of these Repelzol products at my house when I'm worried about something in particular, um, and one thing for me is bulbs is a huge thing. I love my bulbs. And I'm tired of Mr. Squirrel digging up my bulb and moving it to somewhere I don't want it. So that's one thing I always do here is I plant for spring and then do again in the fall with tulips and daffodils. Um, everything's going to get dipped in the, in the solution of the Repelzol because that's just, again, a little bit of irritant. Hopefully they dig down, find my crocus, and go, that doesn't smell very good, and move on and 
go across the street to the neighbors and move hers. That's, that's, that's hopefully the plan. So that's what I did last year. So I spent some serious time and took my vegetable gardens and went up. So you can't see, you can see two of them there to the right and left are also now big galvanized fire rings I purchased. So I'm up out of the ground. I'm able to put a small little fence around there. And again, I'm not dealing with the deer side of it. I'm dealing with the rabbit side of it. So I'm creating a good barrier. The rabbit is not gonna be able to dig underneath my concrete block and it's not gonna be able to peek over the top of that and grab my vegetables here as we started to plant a few weeks ago. So that's one thing for me is going up is always gonna be maybe a little bit of a good idea. You can see on the right there is one of the beautiful pansy pots I planted. This is probably last October. And I thought, you know, I wonder what's gonna happen. I always have pansies in my window boxes and my containers for a little winter color. Let's just put like 20 of them in the ground right by the garage door and see how they look. Well, the rabbits came and made pansy sorbet out of it in 24 hours. So uh, the kind of chuckles like, yeah, that pansy was in bloom. You can see the difference in the two. That's after a week after I planted them. Bottom ones are gone, top ones are just fine, because again, they're up off the ground a little bit. <laughs> so there's a present. I had to take a picture of rabbit poop in my yard, right? So that's a little, you know, the little piles they leave, and I think you would be surprised how many they leave a day. It was shocking to me. Um, but again, it's fertilizer, and it's not soft. It doesn't get in my shoes. I've, I've tried all the above, because again, I didn't want to track it everywhere. Um, so I leave it as fertilizer. You know, it's not, not really that bad. I'd, Wish I could just say eat my lawn and just don't go anywhere else and I'd be I'd be happy if we can just teach them how to cut it nice and even, right? Then, then we'd be in business. <laughs> On the right there is my last raccoon damage from last year. So that is not me digging up and trying to stage some photo. That's them coming in at night and literally tearing up my lawn. And this has happened for like three straight years now. What are they asking? You know, I've tried, I've tried to ask myself that very question, and I think because I'm organic, I obviously have no chemicals in the soil. I think I've got some big fat earthworms. Um, I watch for crane fly quite a bit. I thought, man, I wonder if I got crane fly grubs all over. They're in there grabbing some protein. Probably all of the above, to be honest with you. Um, but once I fixed this, which took me some time, um, you can't see over the right here. I actually have one of the sonic chowder boxes now out there, and they have not been back here. And, the season set so we'll see if that stays the case but that was my first phase was okay let's see what happens if I try this and if that doesn't work I'm gonna go to the next one and I'm sure they'll probably figure it out and I'll have to go to another one after that but um, for some reason my where I'm at in Everett there's just a little migration pattern I know they're not hanging out in my yard all day but uh, I come home I go for a walk every night and I found her a few times in the front yard and then I sprayed her with water which worked very well. She headed out the other direction, uh, but just something again to kind of kind of keep an eye on. So hopefully today we're going to talk a little bit of rabbits, rabbit damage, a little trapping information perhaps if you want to try. Certainly some techniques to deter rabbits and deer, wildlife in general. Uh, plants that they tend to avoid is going to be part of this at the end here too, and then again repellents and concoctions. I love that word concoctions. So I had to put it in the slideshow. Uh, but that's going to be some things. You're going to see a lot of similar ingredients. If I went on the Evil Empire Amazon right now and said rabbit repellent or deer repellent, it's going to be a lot of the same exact products, to be honest with you, but it's going to be very similar in what they contain. So you're going to have a pretty short list of things that do work or do they try to have work. So we really only have two types of rabbits that come around here. Um, Eastern cottontail doesn't belong here. We unfortunately brought it here back in the 1930s uh, for hunting. And that's the one typically you're going to see in town. Um, that's the one I see in my lawn every single morning and usually when I get home late at night um, is the Eastern cottontail. Sometimes if we go out in the hills a little bit it's also the snowshoe hare. This is one I had over at Cleelum, uh, more eastern Washington or the mountain areas. They'll turn white over there, they don't over here because we don't get too cold. It's a good one difference. So. Uh, two similar creatures, rabbits and hares, but a little bit different. You know, both are going to stay close to home. They don't have a huge range. Uh, the cocktail's got great vision, but it's kind of funny. I always like researching different animals. He's got one blind spot right in front of his nose, so if he could sneak up on him, it's probably not going to happen. They got great hearing and smell. Um, a lot of times I've seen nests in turf. I see this a lot at parks, um, Greenville areas. They'll literally get a hole in their grass and kind of patch it with sod. You can't even hardly tell it's there. I have 
I keep my grass pretty tight so I don't get them in my lawn, but I know I've seen them. My neighbors have had a couple of nests they found over the years. Um, they have to care for their youngs for months, so they have to have a burrow that you might be able to find, <coughs> eliminate the nest, and we probably won't have the rabbits hanging around. Um, they're not very fast, but these are the ones if you sneak up on them, you're going to see them kind of bounce like that and zigzag out of here, and that will let you know you got the, the rabbit, not the hare. They're always overnight, so this is not something you're going to see as much during the day. They're going to hide during the day, they come out at night. Um, shrubbery, shelter, tall grass, wood piles. I found them behind my wood pile a couple times. Um, they'll hide out during the day. <clears throat> uh, this is the again the one I see in town a little bit. You can see a hundred pellet presence a day, please. That's about the average for a little rabbit is leaving you a hundred of those little treasures. Uh, but it's again cold manure. Um, and I wrote rabbits too, kind of as a joke, compost tea, please. <coughs> so I'm going to actually uh, try. There's a couple people online that speak very highly of rabbit compost tea and that's not the rabbit itself collecting some <laughs> droppings you make a little sun tea on the patio literally let it dissolve stir it up for a couple days get warm and it makes a great fertilizer or inocula for some things i think a lot of people have maybe tried compost teas over the air well i'm gonna try some rabbit compost tea so there we go hairs are a little different um you know again this is the one that probably does belong here these are fast you're never gonna catch a hair they run in a straight line about 25 miles an hour. So unless you're, uh, what's his name, Hussein Bolt from Jamaica, won the Olympics every day, you're not going to catch a hare. Um, they have pretty quick young, same thing, active on the dust. They're going to stay close to home. The big difference with a hare versus a rabbit is their babies are born eyes open with hair on them, ready to go. And you might see a hare hang with mom for a week, maybe two. They're out, on doing more damage on the ground. The rabbit's going to be more like two, three months. I'd rather have the, the rabbits get a little better chance. So there's a, a close-up of one of my pansies. If you're looking at rabbit damage, um, it's a you know I'm always going to see pretty clean angular cuts. You're going to see a very similar damage on a lot of plants. Um, if they could just prune evenly, it might not be such a bad idea. But of course the pansy, they actually it's kind of funny because these plants now they haven't touched for a while. We'll see if they come back again. But they're actually back to big and they have flowers out on them here this month so we'll see if we'll see if they leave them alone um, one couple of things I think are important on here that I that I worry about I don't mind you borrowing some pansy when it all comes down to it and the rest of it don't eat my woody plants and that's the problem in the winter time is them nibbling on cambium they're gonna try to stay alive with something if there's no foliage around they're gonna start gnawing at the base of trees shrubs and woody plants now I got a problem with that because you're gonna take out my maple my shrub, whatever it is, if there's going to be some damage I can't correct. You know, leafy things will grow back, you know, usually or I can replace them. But I have an old tree, um, it's a tough one, you know, when they start gnawing away in the bark, because that's what we got to avoid. Um, the other one is with rabbits in particular, they're always going to want to go down before up. And I think more people worry about this than protecting the ground where they can dig underneath. And that's always going to be the case. I see that in my yard every time. I'm not as worried about them hopping up over a two-foot fence or a little barrier or into the garden. It's always digging underneath it to get in to grab what's underneath there. So I find little tunnels through all my gates all through the all through my yard here in the last couple of years where I can see where they're going. Now I won't spend a lot of time on trapping rabbits. You know, this will be up to you. Um, you know, you're going to have to check with your local wildlife office. Some towns don't care, other people do. Uh, certainly unincorporated or kind of wild areas are not going to matter um, for getting rabbits or frankly if you're into hunting that would be the other side of it. Um, in Everett it's not going to happen. I mean, you're going to have to ask somebody to come help you or, or make, it, make sure it's okay to get a trap. Um, it probably makes you feel all warm and fuzzy. You know, I don't want to kill this rabbit so I'm going to just pick him up, put him in a cage and go drive out in the woods somewhere and leave him. Sometimes that may work great, other times probably not. You know, sometimes there's a reason why he's probably in town. There's already a, a rabbit population out in that green belt or that woods. So a lot of times it's disease, it's pathogen, or something else might happen. So it certainly makes us feel better as humans if we don't maybe kill it and move it somewhere where it might thrive. But I think twice it probably doesn't work out quite that well most of the time. Um, I would always treat kind of trapping as the final resort after I tried you know, repellents, different plants, different techniques, um, and then go from there. So you'll see on the page here, we'll spend a lot of time on traps, but there's our 
cute little funny friend in a trap there. Um, you know, you can find these on Amazon, some of the wild stores around here, Co-op I think has them down in Marysville. Um, just make sure it's a sturdy one. If you're going to take the time to trap it, um, you know, get a sturdy one with the slip door. It's not going to be able to punch through. Rabbits are pretty strong legs, so if we get something weak, um, they'll just get right back out of it. Um, so wildlife in general here, you know, again, I'm going to talk about kind of a multi-pronged approach. You know, what works for me is not going to work for you or her. What works one time might not work the next time. Um, what works in the front yard in my house hasn't worked in the back, I'll be honest with you, which I found very fascinating, the same yard. Um, and then, you know, try to remember, you know, do some research, consider some of the options we talk about today. Um, but remember that gardening to me is one of those ultimate trial and error things. I mean, either somebody messed up many moons ago and we learned a lesson from it, so we do it a different way. Or we do trial and error in our own garden, which is what I do every year. It's like, I wonder if I try that, will it work? No, it didn't. It goes in the memory bank. We tried a different way the next time. So don't feel like a failure if you don't win the first time. You're going to probably try a couple when we talk about wildlife. So install a fence. Duh, right? You know, that's got to be the easiest thing ever. If I'm trying to protect a garden, some of the easiest thing to do would be to get a fence. But this isn't just my cedar fence around my house, my gates, all that stuff. This is a little different creature. Uh, for a specific area of the garden like the vegetable garden or maybe it's for the whole property you know if I took my cedar fence and I added chicken wire at the base and dug it into the ground a little bit I would have a rabbit proof barrier if I had my whole yard fenced they couldn't get in if I leave it as cedar he's just gonna burrow right underneath it and then he comes the deer reach right right over the top of my five-foot fence and eat away and do, do whatever he wants so um, kind of consider your options a little bit I would always go wire, not wood, it's just gonna last longer. Thicker gauge is the better. For rabbits in particular, I don't even know that you gotta go three feet, but if we're gonna be safe, I think we'd go three foot tall. Uh, something chicken wire, hog wire, doesn't have to be anything super fancy um, that they can't get through um, is the way to go. The biggest thing is buried into the ground, you'll see it kind of rolled away from the garden a little bit. Um, and then again, I usually go straight into the ground about a foot. So I'll show you a picture here on the next one. I want to stick it firmly so it doesn't move. And if I do it right, you know, it might be something that's going to be there forever. I'm not going to have to do this every year, every five years, every 10 years. If my vegetable garden area or whatever the area I'm trying to protect is, is stagnant, I'm not going to have to do this over and over again. It's going to make it pretty easy. So you can kind of see that's a great diagram I found. Something kind of fancy. We like rustic chic around here, right, we call it. So it could be something real fancy or something really simple. I mean, that's just some wood posts pounded in, some braces so it's strong, chicken wire, hog wire laid out, but you can see the bottom is the difference. I've got an extra piece going straight into the soil, and I've also got a piece laying out on the ground that's buried underneath mulch there at the edge. So you that got way, two. Exactly. It's almost like a fence that goes into the ground about a foot, and then an extra piece that's underneath the soil. You can't even see it but it's protecting my ground. So that rabbit's gonna walk up and go, I wanna go in there, but I can't dig down because I've got wire underneath me and I can't hop over because I got wire in front of me. So I've got 100% protection with something like that. With I'm doing deer, it's gonna be very similar. I don't have to worry about the burrowing obviously with deer, but I gotta go up. You know, I've seen deer go over six feet pretty easy. I think if you got up there to seven or eight, you know, that's what I had, we had to do in Cleolum. Uh, then we've got them, they're not going to hop over. An elk are worse than deer, six feet probably might do you around here, but if you want to be safe, we would have a deer fence up around that area that's a little bit bigger as well, okay? Do the double fences really work? Uh, they do a little bit, yeah. I, I wouldn't say they don't work, but again, I think it's, you, you try for some, for most people probably yes, others maybe not, and so we would try that. Oh, it's working great, perfect. If it doesn't, then we tweak it a little bit and then and try something different. Is it important to have the distance between shorter so they can't go? Exactly, hop through, yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah, I, I had tall seven and then a very short one inside of it, and they never really, after we went up to taller over there, we they never really got into both. So, so you put the taller one on the outside? In the, tall on the outside, and I had a smaller one on the inside. Okay. Yeah, part of it was because that was the gate I could roll to get in and out of the orchard there. Okay. I, and again, this isn't to me maybe the whole garden, for some people it might be, but I it's specifically orchard, vegetable garden, stuff I'm trying to get production off of. Um, and of all things that deer eat, roses blow my mind. I mean, that's got to be the worst thing 
to stick in your mouth and gnaw on thorns. But it's, you know, again, if I had a prize rose garden, I'm going to keep the deer because they will mount roses down pretty quickly too. So. <coughs> so these are some fun ones I'm going to play with this year. So I was reading about mirrors. They say that mirrors might help you. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to feel about the mirror in the garden somewhere. <coughs> but again, it's worth a try. I want to try it out and see if it does help. Oh, two CDs. Kids. Yeah, so, so let's do this. We're going to do questions after the oh, class, okay? okay? Yeah, because otherwise we're not going to finish. Oh. So, um, tape mylar. A lot of people have tried, like, you know, bird scare tape. You got a cherry tree, we hang. We used to take our old CDs. I don't even know if they make CDs anymore. But we used to hang the CDs on ribbon and let them sit there and flitter in the sun with all the colors and the kaleidoscope. And that, a lot of times, keeps the, the birds from maybe eating the cherries or reflects the deer or the rabbit a little bit. Um, certainly worth a try. Um, I know for me with kids, I get, often get balloons donated, so I'll probably try some Mylar balloons at some point. Um, we're going to look at repellents here in a minute. If you look at, again, the list of things that might be in a repellent, you're going to see all kinds of yummy ingredients, you know, different kinds of urine. Doesn't that sound delicious? Blood meal, dog hair, human hair, egg solids, thyme oil, garlic, onions, bone meal, citrus juice, cayenne pepper, vinegar. I mean, I found all kinds of different recipes online that you can kind of play with your own thing or again that's exactly the kind of stuff that's going to be um, offered and a lot of the repellents you'll be able to purchase as well <coughs> now the two things that i use a lot frankly irish spring worked very well for me you know I, and that was over in eastern washington it works here as well i know my parents still use that down at their place in the peninsula but a nice fragrant irish dish uh, soap bar hanging um, tend to have the fragrance the deer in particular did not like. So that may be something simple to, worth a try. Hanging on a string and see what happens. They probably won't be out washing themselves. But, um, and I use a lot of hot pepper. That's what I use in my yard against the squirrels. We were talking about bird bird suet this morning now. Um, the squirrels borrowing your bird food. A lot of times you can buy suet, suet cakes that are treated with hot pepper. Birds don't care. They don't taste that. But the squirrels do. So they tend to not eat your suet anymore and let the birds have at it um, you know a dog is always a great idea but I don't know if we've got soft in human history I don't know of many dogs that hang outside anymore most dogs are hanging in car seats or laps or on the couch so if you have a dog that actually likes to be outside that would be a great return for all the above nothing like a dog chasing away whoever it is so there's a kind of a picture I don't know if you can see what the Sun came out here so it's probably washed but that's a, that's a rabbit nest I saw up at the park a few years ago. So that's one, again, in the lawn where you can see the hole. But if I look at the one on the side there, I probably couldn't even see that. You know, there's a little dead piece of grass on top. And if you weren't real careful, um, you might end up mulling over those little bunnies. That would not be a good sight. So what tall weedy patches in the landscape are always going to be issues. You know, if you can keep those weed whacked down or eliminate that, again, sometimes that's the neighbor, not you. But a tall patch is always going to be a place for a lot of creatures to hide out from natural predators and then again right back into your place. Um, I'm going to try getting a spot for um, an owl to nest. I think owls are pretty sweet and because they hunt at night, to me that's the perfect answer for, uh, and a coyote frankly, perfect answer to control our rabbit population. Um, as long as the pets are inside probably with the coyote. Um, you know, those are all great options. If I have a hawk and an owl, a spot for them to perch or nest, they're out hunting at night, and I think they'll eat one rabbit at night, which will work out quite well in my neighborhood. Um, you can see in my yard, you know, I used a lot of raised beds. Again, I'm, I'm okay with the lawn. I'm okay if you borrow a shrub here and there. They don't seem to eat anything to the ground at my place. Do a little free pruning. Um, but I don't want them in the vegetable garden. That's the one place I do not want them on my berries and vegetables So I do some stuff around my my berries that I have in the landscape And then you saw I went up and I'll add some fencing in those areas as well um, I'm gonna think about creating an area for the rabbit see if that might help this year um, They love clover. There's a few other things they would really be attracted to and maybe we have a little corner of the yard We let kind of be the rabbit area and we'll see see if they find that and go back there every time um, I had a lot of people, I read a lot of stuff online before I did this for the Master Gardeners and seeing what other people, even in different parts of the country, were trying. An electric fence seemed to be a huge one for certain places. <laughs> I'd be real cautious with that, I think, around here. Um, we thought about doing that, honestly, at our place over Eastern Mountains. Um, it's just one, 
you know, be, be careful where you put it and how strong it is and the rest of it. Because I don't know that you need to go to electrocution to make this happen. I think the fence would probably do do quite quite well. So does everyone know what a cloche is? Anyone, anyone had a little Martha Stewart craft class and made their cone cloches for their vegetable garden? Um, they can be all kinds of fancy stuff made out of anything. I've seen milk, cut off gallon milk jugs work fine for a cloche and a vegetable seedling. Almost works as a greenhouse too. Um, you could be rustic, rustic chic or fancy schmancy. There's metal ones and plastic ones and wood ones and all kinds of wire. I stick with wire when I built mine. I'm looking for all the Marthas out there. You get a little crafting class. I know a lot of clubs I talk to, they actually have a little cloche party once in a while and they all sit and make these things and share them for the rabbits. Um, and like I said, it could be as simple as a chopped off milk jug. You know, these are some stuff I saw. This is kind of more what I do, just a you know, just a cage I can put around my young seedlings when you plant them or a certain berry. I do these around my blueberries sometimes in the landscape as well where I can protect a particular plant. It's not going to be able to get in there and eat, eat that one thing. Uh, we can certainly buy a bulk pack if you got a bunch. Um, I like the wood looks cool. I totally love wood, but um, again, I'm not looking to replace these every four or five years as they, as they degrade. Um, I think the wood you're going to have to do a little bit more often, whether it's willow typically or, or bamboo would probably be the better choices. Um, and there's a couple pictures I found where you can kind of see, you know, again, raised bed area. They didn't want to add the fence around it, but let me just put a cloche over certain things I know that they're going to want to come in and nibble on, and I've got a little protection on there too, especially when they're young. So woody ones is something I'm working on. Um, I volunteered out to Arboretum quite a bit at Legion Parks. Anyone been down there? Evergreen Arboretum and Gardens. It's a great park to walk through. Um, these little guys and Mr. Squirrel have been gnawing away at my maple collection for quite a while here, and this is the year the war is on. So you're going to see this summer at some point when I got some time, some chicken wire cages going around most of the maple trunks because it's getting to the point where. They've almost got the whole circle chewed off of the base, and then we're going to start losing trees. So um, this is not young stuff. This is old specimens. Some of that stuff's been there 30, 40 years way before me. Um, and it's happened in my yard, too. This is the one that I'm kind of saying, all right, I'm drawing the line right there. You're not taking my trees. Um, so I'll show you a picture here, but you're going to see an easy way, I think, to protect that specimen um, if we are getting the gnawing on the wood, and that could be the squirrel or it could be the rabbit typically if it's right at the base. Uh, we would want to put a chicken wire cage about three feet away from the trunk and then again bury it into the ground so they're not able to dig underneath it and get a home inside of your little circle. Now I can just eat away and, I, and I'm protected in there too. Um, I mentioned the, the maple grove down at Legion I help with. Um, I also worry about you solve one problem and you cause another, so be careful if you do this. Um, to clean out the in, inside of that cage once every year. Maybe you pop it up, clean out, get it clean, put it back down. If we let debris collect in there, I might end up with a vole, a rat, or a build up debris over the years up too far on the trunk and I may lose my tree. So just make sure it's not just putting the cage on there and walking away for all eternity. I'm um, clean inside of that a little bit too. Okay. Um, other materials I don't as much care for, nylon, plastic, Double wrapped aluminum I found quite interesting. I was like, oh, that's an interesting one. I wonder how long the aluminum foil would last if we tried something like that too. Probably a little younger plant, not a, not a bigger tree. But that's a good picture there. You know, if I'm trying to protect, you know, again, <coughs> especially younger seedlings, or if it's the rabbit, the ground animals in particular from getting in there, climbing up and gnawing away at my wood all the time. Again, I think that's more of the, the squirrel rabbit problem. There's a few devices out there, um, you know, we only carry one, we tend to pop in the soil, the sonic emitter. Um, this is basically the same kind of thing I did for my raccoon, but it's above ground and I can't, I can barely hear it, to be honest with you, um, but I can hear the chatter sometimes in the summer if I'm out there and I can hear it kind of going on and off, it's, it's out there for deterrent. Um, again, this is a great example of something that works for him and not for her or me and not for you. I've had people out with large areas in Snohomish swear by those things. Man, I got the moles out and whatever else, and I put those around my property and never had them back. I have other people say, I put it in the ground right next to the last hill I saw, and he dug his next hill up right underneath it. So, um, so again, it might be worth a try. I always put that on here because I think 
get battery, probably not solar would be my recommendation. I've had to replace mine twice now every couple of years because the solar panel just aren't that good on some of those and we don't have sun a lot of the time. <laughs> so charging is an issue to last all night. So these are all D batteries. They work much better. Um, I think maybe battery powered versus solar. Um, and look online. You know, again, I always joke about the evil empire Amazon, but if I went on there and, you know, typed in rabbit, deer, or sonic repellents, you know, I could look at what 100,000 people have done in the last year and go, oh, well, that's the best rated one, here's the next one, here's the next one, and you can kind of read some of the reviews and see how they worked as well. So um, that sometimes might be a, a thing to try, you know, without getting too crazy, try a little repellent. Um, you know, I fought, I hate to say a rat, got into my truck engine and chewed all of my wiring <laughs> twice last November and cost me $2,500. So that has worked with Mr. Rat. I have a box now that sits on my engine block and it's the same thing. I can't hear it. It's sonic, it's lights, it's all kinds of things. I can see it working, but uh, knock on wood, he has not been back since. I'll warn you, if you got a Toyota or certain cars, they actually make their wiring out of soy now. So that was oh, a lesson to me. Like, really? Boy, thanks a lot because I'm hungry and it's the winter and as soon as the temperature drops, like, ooh, wow. I smell that soil, they went and ate all the wiring up wow. my engine block. So, so thank, <laughs> thanks so much. <laughs> so here's some organic repellents. Uh, there's a lot of home remedies out there. Certainly some great products if you don't want to mess with it that are kind of ready to go. I'll show you a few of these. Um, but look online. There's, there, I put a recipe there on the side. You know, we're almost making like garlic sun tea out there with a little spice of hot pepper in it but you can make a lot of that stuff in a simple gallon milk jug if you want to make your own i think you have to apply it a little bit more often but certainly um it's something if you're home especially in the summertime you could easily make up little batches of some of that um, one big thing i want to bring up with the ingredients is that in bold letters egg solids so that's a very common thing it's in a lot of the different repellents we have here at the store and a lot of things i saw online um, I would never take a chance with salmonella. So if you see something that contains egg of any kind, it works as a great repellent for deer, for rabbits, for all the things we're talking about. But that is something I am keeping away from the vegetable garden. Do not use it on your vegetables. The labels will tell you that if you read the labels. Uh, but you want to make sure not to get one repellent and think it goes everywhere. I think we have a specific thing for vegetable and edible, especially if we're going on the foliage. And then we have something else we can use in the yard as well, okay? Um, one big thing, no matter what you choose, you got to do this regularly and you got to do it thoroughly. If you're going to take the time to protect a plant from wildlife, it's not about walking out and blessing it real quick once a season in the spring. It's about keeping up on it. It's probably once a month, especially in the spring, because you may have done it this winter. We have to protect the new growth. This isn't because I sprayed some at the base, especially with deer, all of a sudden my whole plant is safe for the season. Leaves come out, I spray. More leaves come out, I spray again. So I gotta keep doing this about once a month. A lot of the packages again will tell you last great for a month, six weeks. Some are a little quicker than that, but that, then that'll dictate your timing. Uh, like I said, always on the new growth is a big one. Every single one of these things is about two things, smell and taste. So either I have both or I attack it from one or the other, but that's gonna be our repellent methodology is trying to attack it does it taste bad or do I just get the smell and I want to go somewhere else instead um, and I would look at granular you know versus sprays there's some things that will last quite a bit longer granular tends to last maybe a little longer um, than sprays will uh, but it's also going to be at the ground level I don't know that it's a great solution for deer at all it would be a great solution for rabbit, for squirrel, for some of that. But if I need to go up, it's going to be probably more of the liquid form if I'm going to try to get the predators that are up, up top a little bit. So here's a couple. Some of these, like, you know, these are all things we can order in or you can find around. Um, we don't do liquid fence here. Um, it's not good for edibles is probably the main reason. I kind of picked one. We do plant skid, which you'll see here in a second. Um, it's specific for all these things. But there's certainly nothing wrong with liquid fence. It's very highly rated. All these things are natural, biodegradable. Most of these are OMRI listed, organic. So there's no poison in here. As long as I let apply these products and let them dry on to my foliage, it's not going to hurt my dog, my cat, the birds, the rest of it either. It's just I'm going to probably keep the dog in the house if I'm out spraying liquid 
let it dry on for two, three hours, and then do what you want, you know, kind of thing. They'll be fine with that. But this one, again, egg solids, garlic oil, thyme oil, um, all great repellents. But again, with the egg in there, I would only use this one on ornamental issues and not the vegetable area. You see the product there. Uh, this is what we carry here, plant skid, both granular and liquid form. Uh, I think this is the highest rated one, and I usually look at people that are doing this for their life. You know, orchardists, vineyards, uh, people that are growing soybean, corn, crops of all kinds. This is what they're going to. So that to me speaks volumes. I think if we're specifically with the edible side of gardening. So liquid, great for deer, lasts a long, this one lasts probably longer than most things on the market. Um, it's very easy to apply to and very rain proof is the one different. This is just dried blood and vegetable oil. So they'll use assorted critters and dry their blood, powder it, use that in conjunction with vegetable oil. And that makes a great deterrent. This one's worked pretty well for I think most people I've asked. You'll see the bottle there. Um, then there's a few things I've seen kind of traveling around. One of my favorite nurseries down in the Portland area is a place called Portland Nursery. They have a couple locations, a great nursery to visit. Um, sometimes it's product overload. I think they have every single thing you could ever have from every single brand and every product for everything that exists in the garden. So for me, I go down and look at all the shelves. Like, ooh, what's new this year? Because uh, they always have everything, which is probably too much to be honest with you. Um, but this is a couple things I saw down there. Nature's Maze, again, not for use on vegetables. I did like the fact for rabbits in particular or more ground wildlife that this covers a massive amount of area. This was one that you got pretty good, pretty good coverage out of. You'll see kind of how to apply it. If I have a garden bed right there, a lot of us have curbs on our yard, but say you have edge or whatever, it's not just treating the garden edge there but going outside of that for a couple feet. Because if I'm gonna hop up there and think about eating something, I'm gonna get that smell, that taste in the lawn, and I'm gonna probably head the other direction anyway, almost like a secondary barrier before I get into the actual garden. Um, I thought this might be the better one. We'll probably start carrying this. Um, I think it goes a long way. <laughs> this is a great one. Um, I think we can use in the vegetable garden again. We keep it off the foliage. But as a granular deterrent, it would be a great perimeter one. Um, this was a guy found this online too. Um, this is repels by a scent one. It smells like absolute death to rabbits. It does smell a little bit to us. I cracked a can because I'm always curious, like, am I going to get bothered by that? It does smell a little bit. It's not overpowering. But so this is not one I'd probably put by the front door. But out in the yard, I don't think you'll be bothered by it. This is one I think was very effective. Probably had a little more ingredients than most, which I like. You can see there the blood, the pepper, clove oil, garlic oil, um, all smelly things. Um, but certainly the more in there, the better deterrent I think we're going to get. You'll see that rabbit scram. So the last thing here, we'll whip through some plants real quick. Now, um, this is very rabbit specific, the list that I put on my handout if you access it online. Some are going to tie over with deer as well, but this is going to be more rabbit related. I would say, um, again, if you go just about any wildlife going to eat just about anything, if it's hungry. There's certain things I think are, I would use the word proof to, but I don't like that word when we talk anything. You know, there's disease resistant roses, not proof. You know, we have wildlife resistant plants, not proof. Um, there's a few, yes, I, I might put that word in front of, but think of this as things I'm having a much greater chance of them not going and eating on if I try some of these. Um, I would try a bunch of different things, you know, if it was me. I'm looking at my specific areas I want to keep them out of, so what can I put outside of that as a perimeter? You know, is it a swath of lavender is a great choice that I would use probably the word proof next to. Um, I would put some lavender in, maybe he hops up says, oh, I don't like the smell of that. I'm going to head the other direction. Sweet. Served its purpose. Maybe I don't have to have the fence around it. Rosemary is another one uh, that works very well. Uh, but maybe it's where I sighted these certain plants in my yard. Where am I going to put it to try to get the maximum effect of them heading somewhere different? You're going to see a lot of different, a lot of common traits on a lot of the foliage of these plants. There's not so much green. A lot of times it's gray. It's oily. It's very herby. It's got some fragrance. It's not smooth. You'll see a lot of foliages here that carry through with most wildlife that they tend not to like versus just my stock green 
uh, foliage on things. Um, you can see right there, rosemary and lavender are probably two that I would list as more proof than resistant. And then look online, especially for deer, um, not somewhere in Southern California, not somewhere in Georgia, but somewhere in Western Washington, because I think they're going to be honest with you and say, look, here's some things that brow the deer tend not to browse is usually the word they use. Um, again, I don't know if it's proof, but it's a good place to start is some things to try if you're trying to create a barrier. You know, there's some great choices you could put as hedges that they're like, you know, I don't even mess with that. Arbor Valley, they will eat down to the nubs, but if I put a different evergreen in there, maybe they don't even go in that area of my garden because they're just going to head somewhere else because they don't eat it. So there is a lot of options for, for all those. Now, there's a few things in the vegetable herb garden they won't touch. So I'll be honest, some of these I'm going to probably plant the perimeter, you know, see if that might help a little bit and re kind of shape how I do the seeds and the starts as I plant here in the spring. So maybe I put some things on the edge, they don't get in the first place. Other things that are more more prone, we, we leave in the middle. So stuff like onion, garlic, these are, I know my parents use a lot of this around the perimeter of their whole massive vegetable area. Um, hopefully has a little bit of a deterrent to try. I call it aspergrass, sorry, but we'll say asparagus. Uh -huh. The vile weed, I wouldn't eat asparagus. <laughs> Uh, peppers, tomatoes is a great choice. I'm going to use that in the, the front rings on my garden because that's one thing they will not mess with. Potatoes is another one I use. Uh, summer squash I found fascinating. I thought of all the squashes, the one they don't touch, but there you go. Rhubarb, artichokes, basil, and again, a lot of herbs, lavender, ro rosemary, thyme. You know, we'll probably take our vegetable garden and turn it into an herb and vegetable garden, so maybe it's veggies and more herbs around the perimeter. I mean, I gotta get the best of both worlds that way, um, but, but that would certainly help. A few annuals that might help you if you're in certain areas, zinnias, marigolds, snapdragons, alyssum, wax begonia I would put on the proof list. There's no critters gonna eat wax begonia, so if you like those, that might be a great choice. Nasturtiums, geraniums, nicotiana, and that's another one I'd put up there towards the proof thing for bugs and for, for frankly creatures. And I'm going to go fast because otherwise we're going to be here a long time, but I'm going to show you kind of a few plants as I've done this the last few years in my own yard and kind of said, I wonder if they'll eat this and will they touch that and will this stay and will they prune this for me? And these are a lot of things um, that are on the list that I found from our specific area and things they have tended not to touch in my own garden. So stuff like cat mint, nepeta right there, bee balm, monarda, those are both prime examples of what I've talked about at the beginning. Fragrant foliage, not green, a little spicy, things are again, again not, tend to, not tend to get into. So Missifuga is a great little shady, part shade woodland, taller perennial. I hope nobody wants to eat thistle, but our ornamental thistle, the Eryngium, the Sea Hollies, um, that's a cool plant on top of everything else, but that's one they will not touch. Hellebore, super poisonous, um, tend not to hit hellebores. Of course, two ladies out of my 280 I did this in Everett last month said you kidding me they came in and sawed off the leaves at the base and like I don't think they ate them I think they sawed them off and moved them and left the rest alone which that one's probably free pruning you'll still get your hellebore back <laughs> <coughs> um, astilbe's one I know in my yard I use a lot of different astilbe's that's a cool plant um, again as long as we water them and keep them going all summer uh, that's one they haven't messed with same with Brunnera. I have a big clump of Brunnera right in the front of my house. I find rabid little presents all every morning in the grass, five feet away. Well, crocus, gone. Things in front of it, gone. Brunnera looks perfect. So that's another one I would put up there towards the proof list. But again, if you know Brunnera, it's that same thing. I touch the leaf. It's fuzzy. It's coarse. It's got a little smell to it. It's a pretty plant, uh, but certainly something they don't mess with. Uh, I have some monster real sunflowers. Helianthus is our sunflower, so false sunflower or perennial sunflower. That's another one I thought, man, they'll probably eat these down the ground. My little guy Max and I plant big tall seven foot ones to grow every year. Um, and this is one they've never touched for me and those are not inside of my fence. Red hot poker, another one for some. Nothing will eat sedums. That's a pretty safe one there. If we want something, a whole group of plants, there's a plethora of options for sedums. Ground cover, bushy, tall, great choice for against wildlife. Uh, hyssop, you know, the hummingbird man. This is a one I use a lot in, in my 
perennial gardens for a long color season, that Agastache or Agastache, that is one you get a lot of color options. And again, very herby, very smelly, exactly the stuff we're talking about. One that I've never had them take a piece of that. Columbines, great choice here for spring flower. Love blanket flowers, that's another great sun perennial. The Gallardias, um, that'll bloom all summer long, really drought tolerant, nice and low. You would think rabbit would just eat those like ground cover, never touched them and I have them all over my house and in different yards. Ferns, a great choice for shade. Again, I've heard some people, they like to climb in there and saw off a frond or something, but fern is not one that's super edible for, for these types of creatures. Russian sage, a big woody perennial, same thing, fragrant foliage. Flock surprised me. I don't have any flocks in my yard, um, but that was fairly high, highly rated by a lot of folks who do this. Um, said flocks was a good one to try. Foxglove, you know, not native here, but it kind of is native these days because it's everywhere. Um, that's another one, poisonous uh, foliage and everything, but uh, another one they won't touch. Bleeding hearts, that's one I have a lot in my own yard again they haven't messed with. Epimediums, really easy perennial for dry shade, low ground covery kind of habit. That's another indestructible plant I love. Um, they've never messed with those at all. And I had to put some of the Z in here, so I had to put Zauchneria in. Um, has anyone ever tried that? That's a fun perennial. Uh, we'll start having these in in May. Um, that's what they call kind of California fuchsia. They're plenty hard up, hardy up here if we have hot sun dry area. I have a bunch of mine on a slope of my driveway. It's a great hummingbird plant. They bloom like hot orange or reds mm. all through the summer till frost and it naturalizes into a beautiful ground cover. Uh, that's one of my favorite perennials and that's another one never have touched. There's a few more you'll see when you print that handout or look on the website you'll see all this information. There's quite a bit more perennials um, on the list too that we would put as as resistance. You'll see quite a few on there. A few trees and shrubs, um, things like abelia, I think a lot of folks utilize around here. That's a pretty safe shrub. Um, not much eats boxwood. I know it's kind of boring and you don't have to clip it into a triangle or a cube or a, some sort of shape. It can be left natural too. Um, I have a lot of boxwood at my place. It makes great green focal points to me um, and a nice little hedge if you like that look too. Uh, that's a great choice. Smoke trees, you know, smoke tree, smoke bush, depends on how you prune it, right? It can go either way. Um, but that's a fun plant, again, they won't tend to mess with. You can't see that flower, but Heptacodium is a really cool tree these days. Um, present from over in Asia, really nice fragrant summer flower. Not super big, um, but there's some pretty cool Heptacodiums out there if you're looking for a specimen summer blooming tree. Uh, those are kind of, those are fun. Uh, we, most people come in and ask for Wiglia. Wygelia, whatever you want to call it, we know what you mean. Um, lots of good Wygelias on the market, and that one's very highly rated for everything we're talking about today. So that would be a great choice for a nice blooming shrub. We can get dwarf, we can get tall, we can get every size in between. A lot of foliage colors on these now too. Um, this is a excellent choice, I think, for a shrub anyway, but a, a good one against the wildlife. Then we got I put these together because these are the two. Everyone asked for Wiglia or Cotton Easter. So we, we call it cotton easter, cotone aster. Um, there's another great choice, a lot of options for cotone aster, for shrubs, for ground covers, for different things in the yard. Another one they, they will tend to leave alone. Not much going to eat a yucca. I know that's an easy one if you're doing drought tolerant garden. Uh, yucca makes a nice little drought tolerant plant. We can mix into the garden a little bit. Um, and the most all conifers, frankly, which is a great thing up here, not arborvitae because um, they will eat those down in a second, the deer will. Um, but pine, spruce, plants like that, again, very useful as low plants, hedge plants, we can clip them, we have trees, we got lots of options on the conifers that would work quite well. Uh, Euonymus, I always wonder if it's Euonymi, if I have a few Euonymus, but that's a different description. So Euonymuses, sounds fun to say, lots of different ones of those around. Um, again, low ground cover, shrubs, tall ones. I use a lot of Euonymus in my own landscape. Love foliage color, super drought tolerant. That's another good choice uh, for a pretty easy shrub. Um, a lot of Ilex, so maybe not our English holly. I don't like to sell a lot of those to people. They don't, they bury everywhere. But Japanese hollies and these hybrid hollies, yellow foliage, green foliage, I can clip them, I can let them go. 
There's a lot of great varieties of Ilex around that are easy. Acalmias, anyone done mountain laurel? That's a fabulous flower, probably one of the prettiest flowers I think of any of the shrubs that, that we grow up here. Um, mountain laurel comes in all sorts of colors and sizes again, but that's another one kind of like rhododendron um, that grows in about the same type of areas in our climate, the same soil, um, but much more drought tolerant for one. Um, really cool flower, a little different than the roadie, and again, something that's very resistant to, to uh, wildlife for sure. Um, I always chuckle, I had a guy yesterday who showed me another picture of Mahonia and the rabbits that eat to the ground. But our native Mahonias, organ grape, creeping organ grape, leather organ grape, all that stuff's very wildlife proof. That's really easy to grow up here, very useful for our pollinating friends and for naturalizing landscapes. The hybrid Mahonia is the stuff we buy that man has crossed around. Still really good plants, uh, but maybe the rabbits tend to enjoy them a little bit more. Um, there's one in particular uh, called Soft Caress. Has anyone tried that Mahonia? It's a really cool plant. I had one gone in two days. So now it's in a pot. Now you just grow it in a pot and it's fine doing that. That's a very cool <coughs> plant for winter bloom. Um, it keeps the hummingbird happy when it's in flower in November, December, January. But rabbits will eat it to the ground. The label now even makes me laugh because it says, Be careful, rabbits might like me. They put a little funny rabbit on there. It's like, yeah, at least you're... At least you're uh, warning them these days. Do they take over a garden, the Mahonia? I get worried um, about them. I want to do them, but I'm always a little nervous. You can always control Mahonia a little bit. The, the shrubby organ grape, I'd say no. The ground covers and stuff, it's not like, you know, Vinca or something that just grows eight feet in a season and takes over the whole yard. They're slow and steady. I mean, it's very really easy to go to the edge and chop some roots and keep them in an area. But the shrubs stay put. Sh shrubs will stay pretty much put. You know, I'll have a shrub, maybe another little piece off of it. But it's not going to go crazy. Okay. It's not going to go crazy. Uh, Sarcococca just finished blooming. <coughs> Excuse me. That's another uh, very, very wildlife resistant plant. We've got tall ones. We've got short ones for shade. Um, that's maybe one to think about adding in. That's another one I have right near rabbit areas in my yard. And I've never touched those. Uh, maples, they tend not to touch the foliage of. The cambium, I would have to disagree on the winter time when they're done with leaves, they'll eat just about any kind of wood, but this is not something they would bother in the foliage in the season. Uh, twig dogwoods, another native around here. Um, dogwood trees in general too, but rabbits aren't going to get quite that big. Uh, but do twig dogwoods are very resilient. That's another native one we could utilize, especially if we have a little wetter uh, area. That's one that can take some winter wet. Uh, red buds are pretty fun for spring bloom. If you haven't tried Cercis, that's our red buds. So that would be gold foliage, purple foliage. We can do weeping, we can do trees. Lots of different choices on uh, red bud specimens these days. Not going to touch the ericas. You know, that's a great early blooming uh, heather, heaths and heathers. Um, ericas are a great choice for a nice bloom when we don't have a lot of flower. They're easy, low maintenance. Um, great for drought, but that would be something that they would leave alone. And then Lanicera, and that could be vines or the shrubs. Typically people grow uh, the shrub type Laniceras in their yard. The vines we usually put on a trellis or an arbor or something up. But either one of those are pretty resilient for, for browsing animals. Um, so maybe a little better choice than, than some others on that. Red currant, another native they're not going to mess with a little bit. Uh, da oh, Daphne for sure. That's one I have a lot of different Daphnes in my yard. That's not one you'll, you'll have, they'll mess with a little bit. Uh, Dutzia, a little old fashioned plant. Again, nice spring bloom. Um, used to be old Dutzias that got outrageously large. These are much smaller and more manageable. Um, and elderberry is a great specimen. If you haven't tried a lot of the new uh, modern elderberries, there's some fabulous choices for foliage, for bloom, growth habit. You can do black, gold, variegated, some green. Um, but that, those are all great choices against the against the wildlife as well. Uh, last few things here, viburnums of all kinds. Um, most of those are pretty good. There's very few viburnums I've seen them browse on. Uh, Spirea is a great shrub. I think for most home gardeners, really easy if we give them some water. Nice foliage color, easy bloom. That's an easy prune plant too. That's, that's a, that's a no-brainer. Lilacs and mock orange are a couple good old-fashioned plants. Um, again, they're going to tend to avoid those, um, in particular a lot of the new styles of lilac and mock orange, much more manageable in size. 
And then last couple here are the grapes. If you're going to grow something on a vine there, grapes will tend to be much more resilient. Uh, maybe against the rabbit again. The deer I've seen browse a little bit on these, um, so I would certainly apply one of the repellents uh, to try as well. And then last one there is hydrangea. I put the new hydrangea on there on purpose to whet your appetite because it will be a month. But that is the plant of the year this year called Eclipse. So dark black, purple foliage, and a red variegated flower. That's a sweet plant. We'll have we'll stop about a month away. We'll have those. Um, so hopefully today, you know, consider your options a little bit. You know, and again, make your own choices for you and your own garden. Always read the label and the products. They're not, they're not the state is not going to allow us to have them for you to purchase if they're not safe. They're not labeled properly. So if we read the labels, use them as instructed. You're going to have pretty good luck. Uh, please accept some failure. We all do. I do every year many things um, in the garden, but we try We try something else and we keep moving on until, until we win. So um, well, like we said at the beginning, a lot of this is going to be a multi-pronged approach with a few different things to probably get the, the, the results that we want. Um, and then try to continue to do some research. I mean, look online. I don't say that in a lot of my classes because I don't like the internet when they give out a lot of information that frankly is not so swell. But if you stick to the Oregon states, the Washington states, the Master Gardener program, local reputable sources, there's great information on all these topics online as well that you can kind of refer back to, especially with plants. All right. So thanks for coming in today. If you do, um, if you want to try some repellents out, so we carry all the repels online. Mole Max, I even put on there too. If you got mole issues, we'll call that part of wildlife as well. But you got all this 20% off here for the week. So you got till next Friday to do some shopping. Um, if you want to protect some stuff early, this is the time of year to go. Typically, I tell people with liquids, you know, try, don't ever spray anything in bloom, period. So if you're out there looking at your fruit trees right now and you're like, God, I got to get some repellent on there before the deer nibble on them, whatever, let it bloom and then get the repellent on there. We would try to stay probably two, three weeks before flowering and then wait a couple weeks after we're done blooming before we start to apply these things. So try to kind of get a preventative one on early and then hit it a little bit <coughs> later. Um, with the repels all in particular, you're going to see two here. So this is very similar in nature. We can do, again, liquid or granular, okay? That's a very specific one for dog, cat, rabbits, a little bit different. This is the outlier because we take the egg solids out of it. So if I'm doing my vegetable garden, this is the only one I want to go because I can apply this right onto the foliage or around that area and get very good luck. I'm not, I can do granular around my vegetable garden as long as I don't get it on the foliage, but I'm not going to spray the liquid onto my lettuce leaves, my spinach, the greens that I'm going to eat because we don't want again that chance of that salmonella with the egg solid on there. Okay. So you'll see on the labels exactly the same thing. The cloves, the garlics, the white peppers, the cayenne, all the same stuff uh, that we talked about at the beginning. Uh, but pretty good results with all those. This, this is the stuff I use right now at my own place. If I had deer, I would probably step up to this side of it because I think you're going to have much better luck with the plant skid on deer. I always kind of wondered what plant skid meant. I mean, look at the spelling of that word. You're like, somebody got, does anyone know what that means? So it's actually Swedish. That's that's plant protection in Sweden. So I thought, ah, interesting. I don't remember that one. That's kind of fun. I was like, well, that's a weird word. Who, where'd that come from? Um, so again, liquids or granulars, pretty good all-purpose use, especially if I'm going. Again, they work very well with the other critters too, but especially rabbit and deer. If I'm going low, I'm going granular, and I'm doing my perimeter to get to keep the rabbits out. If I'm going up. I'm going liquid and I'm going high because I want to stop the deer from going along and browsing a little bit higher in the ground. Okay? So is that too much? Yeah. A little, a little wildlife overload? <laughs> so I ask a couple questions. What you got? Um, when you used Irish Spring, yep. did you take it out of the wrapper oh, yeah. or did you poke holes in nope, the wrapper? Out of the wrapper. Yeah, I actually poked, just... a, poked a hole through the bar and just tied it onto a string. Okay. Kept it pretty easy. Okay. Yeah, kept it pretty easy. Um, that's the one, and again, it may you may go, great tip, it worked awesome for me. You may come back and say, yeah, I just wasted two bucks on a bar of soap. It didn't do anything. So. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, it's worth a try. That's a cheap, that's yeah. a cheap try, I think. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, so the, uh, on the bulbs as far as squirrels? Yep. 
Are there any that they like more? They like more than others. So I that's exactly what I do now because um, the crocus in my yard were probably up to about 2,000 two years ago, and I'm probably down to 200 now because they're just gone. Um, and I find in places I don't want them as part of it. But when I do my bow play in the fall, you can either do it two ways. I can use the granular, pour some water in it, and have something to dip it. But typically, I'm just using that repels all liquid, and I'm spraying the bulbs before I put them in the ground. That's not going to last forever, but at least they have a chance to get rooted, get established that winter before the squirrel digs it up and moves it. I don't know how smart your squirrels are. Mine are pretty smart. Like I feel like I go around with my my roto drill and I pop bulbs in for the whole day. One day in September, and then he just follows me around. <laughs> same rules. So. Once I started doing that, I have not seen them get displaced quite as much. How's that? Yeah. I wish I would have done it 10 years ago with all the crocus because those are gone. Yeah, there you go. You don't plant them in chicken wire. You can do that if I was, that would be the next phase for me. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> if I'm like, all right, sense. repellents aren't working anymore. Now I'm going to chicken wire because that's a great, you know, it's an easy thing to do. I don't really want to bury a bunch of chicken wire over my yard either, so that's a nice neat one. And again, you know, I, I do a lot of bulbs in the ground. I'm not saying that, but I do a lot of bulbs in pots. I love my flower bulbs. So I have a lot of stuff in pots that are up off the ground and never had any issue with any of that. It's the stuff that goes into the borders by the front door and all the rest of it tend to be the ones that, that get mouthed. Yeah. I looked at my, I used to have probably 500 crocus underneath this lace leaf maple right in my garage and that picture in the front picture and it was just a sea of bloom every spring I love coming home and be like oh it's so pretty then the tree would leaf out didn't have to watch all the crocus turn brown they just disappeared composted see again next year and they are just there's your rabbit cut they are just sawed off every one of them about a quarter inch above the ground and I didn't get one flower again this year so it's like all right maybe next year I'll do a little something around there too so there's my lesson from 2024. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming down. If yeah. uh, the sun's coming out today, hopefully everybody gets a chance to get out and work in the yard a little bit. Yeah, uh, we certainly got lots of great stuff out. The place is starting to get packed. It looks like in, this last week the staff looked at me and said, wow, dude, this place was like empty a month ago. I can't believe how much stuff is in here now. So <laughs> it's been very fun. Yeah, to watch you watch that. it. We we were thinking about one of these years taking this GoPro and put a time lapse. Yeah. And somehow like hang it up and just let it go for like a month. <clears throat> you can see like okay, there's a week, there's another week because it does transform pretty quickly. It seems like a month ago we just had the trees and the roses in, nothing much else, and now it's like, all right, we're we're on, we're in nursery time again here. So <laughs> there's still a lot. Uh, coming in um, you know a lot of shrubs still coming in I'll tell you that's the one thing we haven't shipped nearly all the shrubs and you'll see the perennial area evolve every week more and more we try not to we call I, I tell the staff I call it pots of dirt not many people except hardcore gardeners want to buy a pot of dirt so at least we wait for it to like just wait till it comes out to the pot we know it's good and they can go oh there it comes okay I'll take it home and get it planted because it's a great time uh, with the wet, wetter weather here in spring to get stuff established here before we get to summer. So uh, lots of lots of goodies around. Um, and check the class list. There's, there's a few new classes this year, but we'll, we're getting into the heat of class season, so we'll have stuff going here pretty much every week. I know next weekend we take off with Easter. is really early this year, but no classes next week. But the week after that, you've got about six, six seven straight weeks, both Saturdays and Sundays. So some fun ones coming up. Very cool. All right. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Thank you.